Good morning, friends. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I wore green here. This is green. I know this doesn't count. I don't know if people pinch anyone anymore. I kind of hope not because that was kind of a mean tradition. That I never understood why the pinching was there, but they probably don't do that anymore. Anyway, I just wanted to welcome you to our Sunday worship today. Pastor George has just kicked off this awesome series, and I know that in our Immerse group, as we've read Chronicles, we've sat there and sort of woven through the questions and the charge that have been given at every worship. And so today, we're actually going to talk about what have you wrestled with? And you read about these kings in Chronicles, and you think, I wish they wrestled more with God. Um, but anyway, we're going to today talk about what is your new name or a new name or for your group or for yourself once you uh, become a follower of Jesus and you're done wrestling and you say, God, I am yours. So maybe that's something that you can think about and talk about with your um, whoever you're worshiping with today. So you know what? I want to introduce you to someone. Come over here, James. This is James. Hello. He is our new worship coordinator and this is his first day today. So just pray for him as he steps in and learns all kinds of stuff. And so I'm going to kind of like tell him how this whole online thing works. So you might see him every now and then, although he's going to be busy in the narthex, right? Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Have a good one. We're glad right. you're here. Thank you. Anyway, with that, Easter Sunday, we will be streaming the 8 a.m. and the 9.30 uh, worship services. Monday, Thursday will just be something that you can watch. And then Good Friday will also be live streamed and supported. And so mark that down on your calendar. We'll tell you again next week. And if you would like to volunteer, just sign up and let us know in the Connect card. Now let's go rush down to the sanctuary and we'll join Dave and everyone else and get our hearts ready for worship.
Good morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, the 6th verse, where Jesus is quoting as saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so this morning, I want to invite us as we begin our time together to consciously, openly, willingly come to Christ and to give him all. Our opening hymn is number 86, We Come, O Christ, to You. As you're able, I invite us to stand and sing together. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Sanu. I serve as pastor of outreach here at University Presbyterian Church. You know, all of us make mistakes, right? We all make bad decisions that hurt ourselves and others. Well, the good news is that our God promises healing to the brokenhearted and forgiveness to all who turn away from sin and truly repent by turning towards him. Our God is a God of salvation. So please pray with me as we confess our sins before God. Gracious God, help us to draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Forgive us for ignoring your commandments and straying from your ways. Forgive us. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Well, hear the good news. As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, believe the gospel in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Amen. Hymn number 60, Great is Thy Faithfulness, paraphrases in its refrain a verse in Lamentations chapter 3, which says that God's mercies are new every morning. 
I invite us to stand again as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Welcome, everybody, to University of Presbyterian Church. Uh, if I have not yet met you, my name is Prentice Park. Uh, I get the privilege to serve as the executive director of ministry at our church. Uh, and I just want to say this. Uh, I hope you're wearing green because you know what happens if you're not. Uh, but I suppose all the people here, and I believe so, will be very kind. So we just want to welcome you, uh, again, in person or uh, online or even on the radio. We are so glad that you joined us this morning. Two weeks, can you believe that? Two weeks before Resurrection Sunday, before Easter Sunday. And so we're so thankful that even now and throughout this entire Lenten season, we can prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies to celebrate the risen Jesus. And so again, if you're new, uh, just know that we want to connect with you. We want to know that you're here. Uh, even if you're not new and you have a prayer request or you want to get involved, there's a connect card uh, in the pocket in front of you. You're welcome to fill that out. Uh, put that in our offering plate as it passes around uh, or put it in the silver box 
uh, outside the lobby, or you can even do this online. But we just want to know and make sure that you can feel at home here at UPC. So what I want to do is I want you all to take a minute, so stand up uh, and greet one another and check in to see how their weekends have been going so far. Wow, those flowers do look kind of big. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Let's jump into the chat and let's greet one another. You all got to meet James earlier today. And uh, I also posted the Connect card. And um, if you would be kindly fill that out, let us know how things are. Let us know, you know how, what the weather is like, because we are finally hitting spring here in Seattle. I shouldn't say finally, it just feels early. But anyway, I see Barbara and Mar the Poland family here on the YouTube side. And oh, I see Marge, she just jumped in now. And so um, let's just greet one another. And also, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, the Holy Week online streaming, I will post it in the chat. And so now let's go back down to the sanctuary and we will join our friends and sing the doxology. Well, for many years now, UPC has been in partnership with Bruce and Deb Robinson in Haiti. And we all know uh, the chaotic situation in Haiti, so we want to continue to pray for Haiti. In fact, Deb is hopefully in transit right now coming out of Haiti, going back to Florida. So let's keep her in our prayers. Uh, but we have two members of teams that have gone to Haiti in the past uh, to work with Bruce and Deb. We have Cal uh, Agatsuma and Ray Vanderpoel, and they are going to share some stories of where they've seen God at work in Haiti. So, Cal, why don't you start? Okay. Well, Bruce is well known for his water projects, but he's also into uh, construction and repair of churches and schools. And I'm going to talk about two of those churches. The church at Bay Mostique, was designed by, we could see that here, uh, designed by Bruce to contend with hurricanes and earthquakes that are frequently uh, at, involved with Haiti. And the uh, concrete structure was built by the Haitians, but the arch beam roof was built by a cruise from the US. This church has been used for a number of years as a storm shelter for vacation Bible school for retreats and many other events. Uh, the second church is uh, Bruce's home church in Haiti. And uh, it is, uh, its name is uh, Post Midier. And Bruce has had to repair the roof and walls of this church because of earthquake damage. Uh, this, this, the uh, churches have been uh, used uh, his work has enhanced the experience of worship experience in both churches. The buildings have allowed the congregation to expand their outreach to their communities. Our team was really privileged to experience worship with, uh, with the ha our Haitian brothers and sisters. And uh, because the uh, service was all in uh, Creole, I had a hard time following some of the the things that were going on, but the, the singing was quite spirited. And uh, as you uh, see in this, the Haitians came dressed in their Sunday best, and uh, which was quite a challenge because they had to travel there by foot over long, dusty roads. But they welcomed us with their smiling faces. Mm -hmm. 
One of the struggles of living in Haiti is having sufficient water. The mission compound and guest house in Pascatabois, where Bruce and Deb are, does not have adequate water supply, which Bruce has attempted to correct for some years. One of the joys of going to Haiti to work with Bruce and Deb is getting to know and to work with their Haitian staff. On our last team to Haiti, Bruce wanted to move an existing submersible pump, submersible pump and its pipe out of a non-functional well to a new well he had drilled across the compound. The Haitian staff pulled the pipe out of the old well. We tested the pump to make sure it was working. Then it needed to be carried to the new location across the mission compound. It was quite a sight. The team and the Haitians carrying the 400 foot long pipe on their shoulders, snaking it to the new well house, where it was lowered down the new well. Later that day, it was pumping water. It was very rewarding to all to work together to get the problem resolved. Wow, thank you for sharing those stories. Hey, I've got some good news for everyone. Uh, Bruce and Deb are actually going to come here in person. They're going to be our featured speakers for our virtual mission trip this year. That will be the last Sunday of April, April 28th. And they will virtually take, they will be here, but they will virtually take our congregation to Haiti. So please mark that on your calendars and join us. Let's say a prayer for uh, the Robinsons and for Haiti. Gracious God, we thank you for the, the work, the good work that the Robinsons have done in Haiti over the years, for the teams that have gone to Haiti. And we lift up to you, Lord, the country of Haiti right now. And with all the chaos and, and all the, the violence that's going on, we pray, Lord, that your presence would be felt in that country. And we pray especially, Lord, that you would watch over uh, Deb today as hopefully she is in transit uh, coming uh, back to Florida. So watch over her, watch over uh, Bruce and, and the rest of that community and keep them safe, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our young disciples who are here with us. You are welcome to go join your teachers in the back. Thank you for being with us. We love having you here, and we hope you have a great time in your classes. All right. And at this time, I'd like to invite all uh, our ushers uh, to, to come forward to pass uh, the offering plates. Um, it is time now to uh, offer our tithes and offerings to God, and just a reminder that giving is an act of worship. In thankful response to God's great love and grace, we give back to him a proportion of the first fruits of our labor. It reminds us that our finances do not control us, but rather we control our finances for the building up of God's kingdom. Giving here is easy. The place will be passed soon or uh, if you're like me, you can give online at upc.org slash give. And if you do give online, there are these little green cards in your pews, and you can get one, take one of these and put it in the offering plate as it passes by. So I invite you to join me in giving thanks to God as we dedicate our offerings. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bring our offerings to you today knowing that everything that we have, our finances and our joy and our well-being, comes from you. Thank you for your faithfulness as we steward all that you've entrusted us to do with your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, choir. Beautiful piece this morning. My name is Nawan Zhang, and I currently serve as the Associate Director of Worship and Arts here at UPC. So glad to be here this morning. Um, I will be reading today's scripture passage from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32, and I'll be reading this in Korean. Uh, the slides will have uh, both Korean and English, and so I want to invite us to remain seated and follow along as I read. 밤에 일어나 두 아내와 두 여종과 열한 아들을 인도하여 야복 나루를 건널세. 그들을 인도하여 시내를 건너가게 하며 그의 소유도 건너가게 하고 야곱은 홀로 남았더니 어떤 사람이 날이 새도록 야곱과 씨름을 하다가 자기가 야곱을 이기지 못함을 보고 그가 야곱의 허벅지 관절을 침해 야곱의 허벅지 관절이 그 사람과 씨름할 때 어긋났더라. 그가 이르되 날이 새려 하니 나로 가게 하라. 야곱이 이르되 당신이 내게 축복하지 아니하면 가게 하지 아니하겠나이다. 그 사람이 그에게 이르되 내 이름이 무엇이냐. 그가 이르되 야곱이니이다. 그가 이르되 내 이름을 다시는 야곱이라 부를 것이 아니오. 이스라엘이라 부를 것이니 이는 내가 하나님과 및 사람들과 겨루어 이겼음이니라 야곱이 청하여 이르되 당신의 이름을 알려주소서 그 사람이 이르되 어찌하여 내 이름을 묻느냐 하고 거기서 야곱에게 축복한지라 그러므로 야곱이 그곳 이름을 브니엘이라 하였으니 그가 이르기를 내가 하나님과 대면하여 보았으나 내 생명이 보존되었다 함이더라 그가 분이엘을 지날 때에 해가 돋았고 그의 허벅다리로 말미암아 절었더라. 그 사람이 야곱의 허벅지 관절에 있는 둔부의 힘줄을 쳤으므로 이스라엘 사람들이 지금까지 허벅지 관절에 있는 둔부의 힘줄을 먹지 아니하더라. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. I just want to start off by saying this. Uh, a few months ago, I was guest preaching at a church, and uh, the scripture reader was in Korean and, and did it in Korean, and I was just listening in tears uh, because I've never felt so seen uh, in my whole life as a pastor, as a speaker, and so thank you now. Thank you, congregation, uh, for participating and knowing that even though you may not understand, God uses his word to pierce our hearts and so I pray that that just happened again and again. So with that said, let me pray and we'll get started. God, thank you that you are our God and we are your people. And we thank you that no matter what we go through, no matter what we experience, that your promise is true, that you will always be there for us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so God, for many of us in this room, as we walk into these doors, we are experiencing our own desert moment, our own trials, our own sorrows, even our own joys and hopeful expectations. And God, in the midst of all of that, we know that you were there. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen and amen. I don't know about you, but growing up, uh, one of the things that I love doing was run errands with my parents. I, and I'll never forget this. When I was around third or fourth grade, my mom wanted to go to a little mini mart down the street to grab something really quick. So I said, Mom, can I go with you? She said, of course. So I hop in the car and I go with her. And we go into the little grocery store and we're walking around and I decide to wander a little bit and I happen to end up uh, in an aisle of potato chips, my favorite aisle of the store, and some of you can resonate with that. And, and uh, before I knew it, in my hand were a bag of my favorite potato chips, were really not potatoes, but they were called Cheetos. <laughs> and I grabbed the Cheetos and I run to my mom and I said, Mom, could I please have these Cheetos? And she said no. And like a good third grader, I asked five times, Mom, can I have these Cheetos? And she said no five more times. And I ended up walking back to put it back on the shelf. But as I was walking back, I had a brilliant idea. 
The brilliant idea was to run out and just head, I don't actually know where I was going to go, maybe to the car, but I ran out the door, and before I also knew it, the owner of the store chased after me, my mom soon followed, and I ended up giving the bag of Cheetos back. The, the store owner was gracious where it was no problem. My mom made me apologize. The worst part was getting into that car. And I knew that as I got into that car, it was going to be the longest five-minute drive ever. And in that ride, I knew that it was either going to be a long lecture of how I made a big mistake. It was going to be my mom shouting, saying how disappointed she was, or, or, or tell me how much trouble I'm in and tell me how, how I'm grounded, or this might age me a little bit, I can't play my brand new Nintendo not the two, not the latest one, but literally the Nintendo, the original one. And so I got in the car, and I was waiting, and waiting, and waiting some more. And before I knew it, it was just utter silence in the entire car ride home. Now, I don't know about you, but at that moment, I much would have preferred being yelled at or being disappointed with or telling me how much trouble I'm in. I, I would much prefer that than to be sitting in the car in utter silence. And, and it was at that moment I realized that silence possesses the power to be so deafening. And maybe many of us, we've experienced this before. And the reality is, this is kind of bad news for us here in the West. We have a little bit of a complicated relationship with silence, don't we? There's a few things that silence promotes in our, in our souls, in our minds. Number one, silence can oftentimes feel like a punishment, Hey, we even have a word for something like this. When, when someone's angry with you, they give you what? They give you the silent treatment. We all know that. Punitive punishment. If not being punished, we feel like uh, we're powerless. Like all we can do is just sit and wait because there's nothing no information, no nothing telling us what step to make, uh, no noise, no information. And so either we feel punished or we feel powerless. And, and I'll tell you what, in an age where we're increasingly becoming an on-demand kind of people waiting and in silence is becoming more impossible. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but if I'm hungry, I don't even have to get up from my couch. I can just pull out my phone, go on Uber Eats or DoorDash, and order my favorite meal from Chipotle. Uh, if I need a ride, I don't even have to drive. I, again, pull out my phone. If I need information, I don't have to wait. I don't have to read anything. I just pull out my phone. Nowadays, uh, if one wants to meet somebody special, they don't have to go out. They don't have to have conversation. Again, they can just go on an app and start swiping left or right and find their lifelong partner. <laughs> On-demand kind of world. And if we don't feel punished by silence, if we don't feel powerless, I would say this is the worst part, we feel abandoned. I mean, have you ever felt alone in a room? Even in a crowded room, have you ever been inside and you just feel alone because no one's talking with you? There's no conversation, there's no discussion. Silence can oftentimes feel like abandonment. And I know that for many of us, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, or maybe you're not, you've experienced all these things with God. And again, with, so, with this many people in the congregation, I can almost guarantee that there's people in this room who wa who's wa who've walked in this morning, who've prayed this prayer, God, where are you? God, I need you. God, why is this happening to me? God, why have you abandoned me? 
God, why are you silent? Maybe it was a health diagnosis. Maybe it's a crisis in in our finances. Maybe it's relational brokenness. Maybe it's a barrier between you and your children. Maybe it's uh, an addiction or whatever it is. We pray and we say, God, where are you? And we are met with silence. And in that silence, we can only come to the conclusion, are we being punished? Am I being punished? God, are you distant from me? God, have you abandoned me? I feel so powerless. Many of us, we've experienced this. And the problem with this is is what I call we enter into this cycle of anxiety. And and here's what this cycle of anxiety looks like. And I drew up a little board with you. We experience silence. God, where are you? And, And then I don't know about you, but whenever we feel this anxiety from silence, we move to catastrophe or catastrophizing. If we don't know the end of a story, we make up a bad ending to the story in our minds because a bad ending to the story is still better than no ending to the story at all. So we imagine the worst case scenario. I remember when uh, I was first wooing my wife, Maria, and we, a friend introduced us, and as the young folks say, I slid into her DMs, which means I started messaging her, and I remember just asking her questions like, how was your day? And her response, and I was imagining her saying, give me this whole long list, and then she's asking me something, but her response was, good. <laughs> Period. Period. And, and then I remember looking at it and, and just saying, okay, that's it? You're not going to say anything else? You hate me. You don't ever want to see me. I disgust you. You don't want to date me or whatever it is. Our mind starts to catastrophize in our anxiety. And when we're anxious and we catastrophize, then we move on to self-soothing or I would even say idolatry. Where we find what I would call God substitutes. Well, money will fix this. Well, a relationship will fix this. Upward mobility will fix this. Addiction will fix this. Watching stuff on the internet that's inappropriate will fix this. Whatever it is, we find these self-soothing methods that eventually start to disappoint us. And then we actually start that cycle all over again. You go from silence to catastrophe to idolatry to disappointment. A good example of this is Moses, and I won't unpack the whole story of Moses, but uh, Moses, who was the representative of God to the Israelites, goes up to Mount Sinai uh, to hear from God. And and at this one story in in Exodus 32, uh, here's what happens. It says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not not know what has become of him. And so apparently Moses was taking too long on top of Mount Sinai. And so the people started panicking. They started getting anxious. They started catastrophizing. And so they had to build their own God. And we all know how that turned out. Not very good. And oftentimes we're like Moses, who quickly forget. I love the verse where it says, Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt. So they know cognitively that Moses rescued them out of slavery, headed towards the promised land. And yet even knowing that, because he was gone, he was silent, he was away, they began to panic in anxiety and start to build their own God. And many of us, we do the, just that. Now, all throughout the families of God, throughout the Old Testament, and even throughout the New Testament, we see failure after failure of God's own people. And then we get to the story of Jacob, who ultimately has failures of his own. And for the last several weeks, I can't unpack the entire story again. Uh, If you haven't been here, I really encourage you to go on our YouTube or our podcast and listen uh, to the story of Jacob wrestling with God or or this angel of God. But as we look into that passage, there's a verse that I do not want us to miss. And the verse is in uh, verse 29, 32 
32, 29, it says this. When Jacob asked him, this is after they wrestled all night. Jacob uh, says, please tell me your name. But God says, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. Now, sure, we can read this story and see that Jacob was blessed because God is faithful, always faithful, no matter what. We know that. So, yes, God blesses Jacob. But if we unpack this for a little, for, for a little bit, let's take a look at the, the, the situation that Jacob was in. Number one, I would say this. Jacob was alone. Jacob was alone in verse 32 to 24, it says, after he had sent them across the stream, his whole family and all his possessions, he sent over all his possessions. And then in verse 24, it says, so Jacob was left alone. So Jacob was going back to his hometown. And on his way, he wrestles God. But you have to understand that Jacob was all by himself. He sent his family and his possessions ahead And he was left to confront God and the angel and have this wrestling match. And he was all alone. And now not only was he all alone, but number two, he was in fear for his life. We all know that he was deceitful. He stole. He did his brother Esau very dirty. And he got word that Esau was after him with 400 men. And in Old Testament symbolism, 400 uh, is symbolism for military might. And so what he understands is not only is he alone, his life is in jeopardy because his brother is after him with 400 men to kill him. And lastly, he's physically and emotionally and mentally drained. Now, for those of you that know me and have known me for a long time, know that uh, I've always been a wrestler. I wrestled in middle school, high school, all throughout. And, and in high school, a wrestling match is six minutes long. And, and believe me, it's a very painful and long and exhausting six minutes. And to know that Jacob had this wrestling match with God till daybreak, you can imagine how exhausted and tired and in pain Jacob is in. And it's in this context where I can just imagine Jacob is going to God desperately saying, who are you? Please tell me your name. And the word please is just a help from our English translator to denote how desperate Jacob was to know. And the word tell is this Hebrew word, nagah. And and nagah doesn't just mean to say a word, but it's this notion of uh, conspicuous, make known, declare, make clear to me. So basically he's saying to God, God, make clear to me who you are. God, declare to me who you are to me. Now, at this point, I believe uh, Jacob knew that he had just wrestled God. So it wasn't like he didn't know, but what he was saying is, God, give me affirmation. God, tell me who you are. Tell me that things are going to be okay. God, I'm alone. Esau is going to kill me. I'm exhausted. All my family is sent ahead. God, you know what I'm going through. Tell me your name. Tell me who you are. I want to know. I need that affirmation. (laughs) And God says, why do you ask? Not the answer that Jacob probably wanted. You can call that silence, you can call that the wrong answer, but regardless of what you call it, it wasn't the answer that Jacob wanted in the midst of everything he was going through. Now scholars aren't exactly sure why God would respond in the way that God did, but there's a story in Judges that might give us a clue. In Judges 13, uh, there's a story about a man named Manoah, and he's kind of an obscure person. You may not ever have heard of him. That's okay. But Manoah was the father of someone who you might know. His name was Samson. 
long hair, strong, hairy, you know, big tough guy. That was, Manoah was his son. Now before Samson was born, Manoah and his wife, who's unnamed, uh, struggled to have children. His wife was barren. And, and an angel came to, uh, to Manoah and his wife to say, well, in fact, you will have a child. And here's what Manoah says to this angel that approached him. What is your name? So that we may honor you when your words come true, when my wife has a child. But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? It is too wonderful. And the Hebrew word wonderful is pili. And it doesn't just mean, oh, it's great, it's wonderful. But there's also this notion of mystery. It's beyond comprehension. And so I look at this, and I look at the story of even Moses, and what does this mean? What does this tell us? Well, number one, I believe it tells us this, that sometimes God answers our prayers exactly the way we ask and when we want, and we've experienced that. When God approached Moses in the burning bush, Moses says, what is your name? And God answers, I am that I am. I really, a better translation would be, it's this continuous verb, I will be who I need you to be. Again, it wasn't just saying, here is my name, it's affirmation of who I am for you. So it's not just, I am that I am, it's I will be who you need me to be. I will do what you need me to do. That is my name. God answers right away. But sometimes God answers our prayers in his own time. Palil, it's a mystery of when. Do you know that Tradition says that when the Israelites uh, from Egypt went to Canaan, the land filled with milk and honey, it took them 40 years. And a lot of that 40 years is because there's wandering and there's left turn and bad turn. There's good times, there's bad times, there's this, there's doubt, there's everything else. And then 40 years later, they get to the promised land. Did you know that a direct route would have taken 11 days? 11 days. But see, scholars believe that had they taken the direct route, there would have been Egyptian military posts all throughout, and they would have been wiped out. And so God, in God's own wisdom, made them wander for 40 years, I would even say for protection, and they made it to the land filled with milk and honey. So sometimes God answers your prayers right away. Sometimes God answers our prayers, but in his own timing, and that timing is a mystery. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers at all, and that's beyond comprehension. But what we also realize is that an unanswered prayer is the answer to prayer. Sometimes what we pray for isn't always what's best, sometimes even hurtful. God knows that. And so many times an unanswered prayer is the answer to prayer that we prayed the whole time without us knowing it. And on the other side of patience, on the other side of faithfulness and obedience, God has something better for all of us. And so I look at this story. And so what is it exactly that we can learn from Jacob? What did Jacob do? And I would say this. If we can learn anything from Jacob, from this day forward, I would say this. Jacob remembered. Jacob remembered. In chapter 28 it says this. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, and I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. 
for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. What I believe about Jacob is that Jacob in his loneliness, Jacob remembered this promise. In his fear, Jacob remembered God's promise. In his hopelessness, Jacob remembered God's promise. In his exhaustion, Jacob remembered his promises, his promises to never leave him, his, his, the ways that God has blessed him and his family. And what we'll see is how God blessed his descendants moving forward. We see God's faithfulness uh, again in Exodus as God rescues his people from slavery into again Canaan, the land filled with milk and honey. Jacob remembers and has a lot to be grateful for. And I bet if we look back in our lives, no matter how hard it is right now, and no matter how hard it will be with whatever you go through, I bet if we look at our lives in hindsight, objectively, we can think of a time that God has healed us of our illness. We can think of a time that God has provided for our needs. We can think of a time where God comforted our souls when it was in sorrow. When God loved us unconditionally when we're drowning with shame, we can think of a time where God has forgiven us in mistakes that we've made that perhaps nobody else in the world knows about. And if nothing else, we can all look back and give thanks and remember that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to resurrect on the third day, which we call Easter Sunday, on our behalf so we can have a relationship with God and have everlasting life. And I would say this, because of that fact alone, if God does nothing else for us from this day to the day I die, I can be thankful for the rest of my life. And I know that's true for many of us, if not all of us. Many of us, especially around the University of Washington, were familiar with this uh, couple's uh, relationship psychologist named John Gottman. <clears throat> and he wrote many books that even my wife and I have read. And uh, John Gottman, he says this. He says, you know what? I can predict whether a couple will stay together within just two minutes of meeting them. And in the book, he says, why? You know, how do you do that? And he says, I asked two questions. How did you meet, and how did you feel about that? And, and he says this, even if a couple's been married for 30, 40, 50 years, if they can think back from the very beginning, no matter how much trouble they're in in their marriage, if they think back and say, you know what, things are tough now, but, oh, boy, when we first, when we first met, it was, it was great. Oh, he was so handsome. Oh, she was so beautiful. Oh, he was so kind. If they remember with fondness and gladness, he says there's hope in the marriage. But he says if they look back and say, oh, it was horrible from the beginning. <laughs> oh, he's always been like this. She's always done this. Then there's trouble. If they remember with negativity and bitterness, there's trouble. Because you see, remembering especially as followers of Jesus, bring strength in our weakness, remembering bring God's hope in the most hopeless areas of our lives. Remembering brings God's joys when tears have overshadowed our experience. And I'll end with this. A couple years ago, I was pastoring at a church in Seattle and I get a phone call. It was a Saturday morning. It was from a congregant. And I was like, man, it's Saturday morning. Why are you calling me? And I didn't want to answer. But there's something in my spirit that told me to answer. And I answered. And it was a family. It was a dad and a one-year-old. He said, Prentice, my son is dead. And I immediately get into my car. I drive to his house. The coroner's there. And we're just crying and crying. I meet with their family for the next couple of weeks. We have a memorial. 
and I get the privilege to, to preside. And, and after we were done, I just give the dad and the mom a, a big hug just in tears. And I'll never forget what dad said. He said, Prentice, I know that God loved my son. In the midst of pain and loss and grief, the hope that he had was he knows and remembers the love of God for his son. There's power in remembering. And so I want to give you a couple practices this week. Practice number one is to be still. And I would even offer on a weekly basis, take a Sabbath, a whole 24-hour period where you can just be still before God. Every day, take an opportunity to be still for five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. I love what Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says about this. He says, Sabbath, or being still, is being rebellious against the world. Because the world tells you, you got to move you got to produce. you got to work. And I just want to say this with all respect and love, and I say this to myself. The world will move on with or without us. And so take just a few minutes to be still before God every day. And I give you this challenge, even for the next two weeks until Easter. Take 10, 15 minutes every day And in that stillness, take an inventory of the ways that God has shown up. And I bet you, if we're that intentional, God will speak and God will remind us of the ways that he's come through for us. You see, silence can paralyze us us with fear, but to remember gives us the courage to march on. Let's pray. God, thank you. And no matter what we bring to the table, you love us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. Help us to remember that promise. Help us remember the ways that you've already come through for us. Especially through your son, Jesus Christ. And may that give us courage and boldness to move forward with hope, joy, and gladness forevermore. In your name I pray, amen. Friends, Jesus is inviting us to draw near. Let's stand as we sing.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, thank you for the season of Lent. Surround us with your grace, love, and peace that surpasses all understanding. Open our hearts to the ways you're calling us to be the body of Christ beyond the walls of our church. Jesus, thank you for offering your body for us for our salvation and restoration. We're grateful for the gift of our life and our bodies. Forgive us for our, our assumption that they are ours to own instead of ours to steward. Give us wisdom on how we can honor you and follow you, even when you seem to be silent. Lord, grant us the strength to face evil and injustice. Help us to love as Jesus loved, to serve as Jesus served, and to be salt and light in the world through what we say and do. God, we lament the violence and chaos in our world. We remember the abduction of children and other kidnappings that are happening in Nigeria. We continue to ask for an end to the wars in Ukraine and Gaza and for protection for those who are in danger. In Gaza in particular, we pray for successful negotiations to end the violence, immediate release of hostages, for protection and provision for all vulnerable civilians as well as aid workers, food, pure water, and access to medicine, that their physical and emotional healing may begin soon, that they would have all the support they need to rebuild their lives. We also lift up to you the terrible situation in Haiti. We pray for safety in particular for our mission partners, Bruce and Deb Robinson. Lord, pour into our hearts your compassion, strengthen and guide us as we live out our faith. God, we lift up those in our church family. We, we pray for college students as they enjoy spring break this coming week. We ask that encourage them on their faith journey. And we lift up to you those from our congregation who need your help. Uh, for Bob Davies, for successful surgery on Wednesday for his torn Achilles tendon. For God's peace and presence for Jung, who's having a CT scan this week. For Sandra Vanderpaul, and for Bong and others in our church family with health issues or who are recovering from injuries or surgery. And Lord, in commemoration of St. Patrick's Day today, we pray St. Patrick's breastplate now. Christ with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ on our right, Christ on our left. Christ when we lie down, Christ when we sit down, Christ when we arise, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of us, Christ in every eye that sees us, and Christ in every ear that hears us. We lift all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us to stand once more as we sing.
as we leave this place, I remind you of a few verses throughout the scriptures. Deuteronomy 31, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jeremiah 29, I have plans to prosper you. Psalm 6, I hear your prayers. Exodus 14, I will fight for you. John 14, I will give you peace. As we go into the world. My lovely daughter. With hope and joy and smiles and laughter. With sorrow and pain. Hardships, hopelessness. May we remember that God is good. That God is faithful. God has been faithful. And may that give us the strength to march forward day in and day out. Again, I want to invite you to our Easter service in two weeks. 8, 9, 30, and 11. That Holy Week, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, 7 p.m. here. Those are the days we come, we celebrate and know the gospel of Jesus, that in our lives, no matter what we go through, we can experience the good news. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, everybody. Thank you, friends, for worshiping with us today. If you would like prayer now or any time throughout the week, please email us at prayer at upc.org, and your prayer request will be sent over to our prayer team. And now, um, boy, Prentice told us a lot, didn't he, today? And so um, our charge today is to be still. And even if it's for one minute, but just that intentional time of being still. So I pray that that time is available and that you'll take um, you'll do it, and we will see you next Sunday on the 24th. Have a great week. Bless you all.